I ask everyone this question, uh, regardless of anything else. Could you introduce yourself and say what it is you do? Sure. Hi, my name is Roger Eschbacher. I am a animation writer, an animation writer, a uh, novelist of uh, YA uh, sci-fi and fantasy, and I'm an actor and a dad and a husband. What are your earliest memories of television and film? My earliest memories of television are when I was a real little kid, uh, I remember sort of uh, sort of flash becoming aware of television uh, through this one uh, Japanese series. I guess these days they call it anime. I don't know what it was called back then, but the name of the series was Eighth Man. And it was uh, Tobar, the Eighth Man, Tobar, robot spelled backwards. It was all about this uh, guy who uh, fought in crime, but like giant monsters and stuff. And he would transform from an ordinary person into Eighth Man, who had uh, super speed and whatnot, by, by smoking a cigarette, a certain kind of cigarette. I don't know, you know. These days, there would be all kinds of stuff read into it, but back then, it was like, yeah, he smokes a cigarette and turns into a superhero. Okay. So that was my first sort of TV uh, memory. And uh, my first film memory, I think, was... Uh, when I uh, went with my my family, took me and my uh, brother and my sisters to go see Mary Poppins, which was a big deal. And that was just sitting there, you know, in this whole, for me, completely new experience of a big theater with a giant screen. It was like I was blown away and uh, I guess fell in love with uh, film and TV uh, or pretty early on. Did you always want to work in Hollywood? Um, always, if you count, uh, starting in high school. <laughs> yeah. And when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a scientist. I was obsessed with, uh, dinosaurs. So I wanted to be an archeologist and a paleontologist and all that stuff. And, you know, knew all the, all the different, uh, dinosaurs and whatnot. And, uh, but as I got older, I found that, um, in terms of, uh, what's required for science is fairly good knowledge of math. And uh, math is my Achilles heel. I'm not that good at it. Uh, uh, the basics, you know, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, I'm fine. But, uh, you know, geometry and trigonometry and all that stuff uh, just baffled me. But anyway, so I sort of uh, shifted away from that and started thinking about doing other things. And uh, then in high school uh, is when uh, Saturday Night Live uh, first started. And uh, part of that, I had been uh, hooked on uh, uh, Monty Python, which they ran on the local. I, I grew up in St. Louis. They ran on the local PBS station uh, late at night and on Sundays, I believe. And uh, so I, I sort of got into those, and that's where sort of the inkling, the uh, small uh, little tickle, I guess, in the back of the head going, you know, I, I think that would be kind of cool to do that. So, uh, and, you know, I'm starting there, I made uh, – movies, little films and whatnot with my friends and sort of just generally get got more experience in that and, you know, studied uh, all kinds of shows, uh, you know, enjoyed them, but also like studied, uh, you know, could I write for this, you know, thinking in my head. So high school. Did you go, did you study writing in college or did you go straight to Hollywood? I got, uh, I went to University of Missouri at Columbia called Mizzou and Mizzou. Uh, there I, what's that? I'm from Kansas City, so Mizzou. Well, so you're you're uh, not an alumnus, <laughs> though. Just a uh, well, sure, but you're well aware of it. Yes. Um, so yeah, it was a good school, a uh, big state school. You know, lots of lot like forty thousand students, I think, when I was there. Maybe bigger these days. I don't know. But uh, I got a a general um, uh, communications degree, and uh, so within that, there was like you know. I took uh, you know, acting classes as an elective, and uh, I, I think I took one screenwriting class while I was there and wrote a screenplay. <laughs> it was horrible, of course. First screenplay uh, is not supposed to be good anyway. But, uh, yeah, I got sort of general uh, exposure to um, uh, showbiz and entertainment there, but not really. Not, it wasn't like going to a film school at USC, let's say, or you know UCLA, so... When did you go to Hollywood? Did you first go to Hollywood or did you try your luck elsewhere? Well, I graduated uh, from Mizzou and then uh, 
I went back to St. Louis and tried to do everything I could to get a job related to broadcast and working at a radio station, working at a TV station. I mean, St. Louis is a great town, but it's not exactly a hub of entertainment. I, I think they've gotten more, you know, work or more like film shooting there and stuff since then, but, uh, it was impossible. And, uh, so I ended up, I ended up getting, uh, let me tell you, if you, if you have a dream of, you know, working in entertainment or the arts somewhere like that, there's nothing like a really, really, really horrible job to sort of motivate you <laughs> to get out of your uh, current si situation and pursue your dream. And I had a, I had a job and there was, you know, there were nice people there, but I had a job working at a, uh, place that built um, those big refrigeration units at uh, supermarkets, you know, that with like a lunch meat and stuff like that. In them. And uh, it was the hardest job. Uh, it, was, it was like a big baby, but uh, it was, there was no air conditioning. And this was during a heat wave. The uh, summer after I graduated from college was a heat wave. So, I mean, I, I was skinny back then, but I easily lost 10 or 15 pounds. Well, just the irony. <laughs> <laughs> exactly through uh just sweating you know sweating uh but anyway so i went there and i was working there and like oh, what i'm gonna do what i'm gonna do and then a friend of mine uh tom kramer a great guy very talented director very funny he uh, uh called me up and said he was working on this show called fridays which uh most people probably don't know but it, it was a, a a show that was um in the uh, early early 80s, and uh, it was sort of a uh, sort of a, a, a ABC version of Saturday Night Live. You know, they had a cast, uh, people like um, Michael Richards and Larry David uh, came out of there. And uh, uh, you know, anyway, my my friend Tom was doing short films, short comedy films for that show, and he said, uh, "Hey, uh, I know that uh, they're hiring." Uh, for runners, which is like a gopher, you know, the people that go and get lunches for the cast and that sort of thing. Are, are you interested? And uh, he says, uh, it pay, only pays $150 a week. <laughs> and I went, yes, yes, I am interested. So uh, I, I uh, packed up my uh, uh, 1968 VW uh, Squareback, which is a cool little uh, – uh, station wagon, VW station wagon, uh, and uh, drove out to Los Angeles, and uh, the rest is history. Your credit is production associate, so you were basically just getting people lunches? Yeah, the, the, that's the official credit production associate, but uh, at, at the time, the vernacular, you were a runner, meaning you know, run and do this, run and do that, and uh, it was it's the sort of the entry-level job on just about any show or film or whatever in entertainment. And, uh, you know, so I worked for uh, uh, Fridays, uh, Moffat Lee Productions, uh, also very nice people. And, uh, uh, you know, worked my way, uh, worked on a, a, for a, the last season of Fridays and then went, uh, they produced another show called uh, Not Necessarily the News, which is on HBO. And it was sort of like an early news uh, parody sort of thing. Uh, uh, with a, you know, fun cast and all that. And, uh, you know, from there, you know, I, I, I that's where I started, like, uh, actually during Fridays, I started, like, writing sketches and trying to get them on the show. Uh, same with uh, um, uh, Not Necessarily the News. Uh, and, you know, I had some success with that, but uh, basically was working more or less in production, like uh, production coordinating, uh, researching, um, uh, production managing was uh, the farthest I got in management uh, in uh, in production, and uh, uh, I wasn't terribly good at it. <laughs> I think everyone would agree. You know, I, I did my best, and it was good to be working. And I had friends, and they would hire me and stuff like that. And you know, I was fortunate to to be you know to get have regular employment in that. But it was it was not you know really what I came out to Hollywood to do. I came out to you know be a creative force of some sort, you know, whether that was writing or acting, uh, I, I hadn't quite figured that out yet. So, but at that point, um, you know, it, I, I did a lot of production jobs and, it, and it, at one point I just said, you know, I, you know, 
told my wife I can't uh, I can't do this anymore. Um, I guess we were engaged at the point. Uh, I can't do this anymore, and so I committed to pursuing, um, you know, uh, taking you know uh, other jobs. Like I, I drove a um, an RV for a makeup artist. She had like an RV she had converted into a mobile uh, makeup studio and uh, for different productions. And I did that for a while, and like any sort of production jobs where I wasn't uh, sitting at a desk, you know, adding up numbers and, uh, you know, worrying about getting yelled at for not having the coffee yet on set at four in the morning, that type of stuff, which uh, that was the, that was a part of production, isn't it? Not crazy about it. But uh, so, but I, you know, did whatever I could to make money. And, and eventually I started sort of like gradually, you know, uh, getting gigs, uh, you know, uh, people, you know, that really sort of kicked off. I was, uh, I don't, I don't want to jump ahead in here, but I'll just, uh, <laughs> so it seems to be going, uh, I auditioned, uh, to get in the groundlings and the groundlings is a, uh, a well-respected comedy group, um, in, uh, Los Angeles. They have their own theater, you know, uh, people audition to get into it. And, uh, you know, it's people like, uh, uh, Phil Hartman and Lisa Kudrow and Mindy Sterling and a lot of, a lot of really funny, talented people in front of the camera and behind the camera. You know, directors, writers come out, come from the groundlings. Lots of people in animation. So I, uh, I auditioned for that and, and flopped. I did not get accepted, but they said um, they were kind. You know, I think, think you may have something, but uh, we think you need to sort of, you know, mature your voice, so to speak, your comedy voice. And we know this one lady, uh, Cynthia Segetti who uh, unfortunately is no longer with us, but uh, uh, she was a, an outside teacher and also a teacher at the Groundlings that she taught outside classes. So I took that in a number of years and then you know, for a number of years. And then uh, eventually I got, I got into the Groundlings school and worked my way up, you know, uh, beginning intermediate writing lab, uh, advanced class Sunday show, which is kind of like the, uh, the farm team for the main company. And then amazingly, because with each step that I was moving along, I was expecting, well, this, I'll, I'll do this. Let's have fun. I'll, I'll see what I can do, learn my, hone my writing skills or whatever. But amazingly, uh, I got into the main company, uh, which was pretty cool. It was, that was a, probably one of my big, uh, you know, personally, but to anyone else, I don't know. But to me personally, that was one of my big achievements. Uh, so uh, then I got into that. And then anyway, once that happened, then things opened up majorly for me uh, in terms of like uh, I, I got a commercial agent. I got a, a theatrical agent, commercial for commercials. Theatrical is what they call the agents for uh, like uh, uh, sitcoms, TV. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll connect you with the casting people and uh, sitcoms and TV and uh, and uh, film and uh you know, so I, I got into all that and, and uh, eventually got a, a writing agent, uh, started writing. Uh, my first real writing job was uh, on a, a show called Ah Real Monsters, which was uh, on Nickelodeon uh, back in the uh, late 80s. 93. Yeah. 93. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, and from there, that's sort of just sort of... Uh, rippled off from there, but I'll stop and let you ask another question. Um, you talked about being on, just a quick glance back at Fridays. Were you there, I have to bring this up for historic reasons, were you there during the infamous uh, Andy Kaufman episode? That was the season just prior. Um, I was there for the, I don't know if you recall it at all, but there was a subsequent episode where he came back on uh, uh, claiming that uh, he had found God and he was like a sort of a you know, I guess he was like making fun of like a uh, zealot. Yeah. Like a zealot. He was, uh, had, had, uh, he had, uh, found God and was now, uh, you know, reformed. I think he, I think the theme of, of that particular episode was like an, an apology episode. And, uh, I don't, I don't know how that ended up, but I'm, I'm sure he wasn't, I'm sure he wasn't, uh, well, I know he wasn't that convincing. So, um, was not necessarily the news your first on camera? No, my first on camera was uh, on Fridays, and uh, my friend Tom uh, directed me in a, uh, a it was a funny uh, sort of a, a 
like a, a parody promo for an upcoming network show, and it was called Assassin MD. And I was not the Assassin MD. I was I said I had no lines. I was just a bystander on the street who uh, reacted to what was going on. And the premise of the of the bit was that it was a doctor who would. Like, would this ever happen these days? Could they ever get away with it? No, but he would uh, shoot uh, people and then come and cure them <laughs> and then save them. So he was the assassin MD. So uh, that was my my first on camera. And I think I did one or two other uh, sketches on Fridays, uh, you know, with uh, with Tom and uh, a lot of fun. It was, it was it was great. And that was the whole thing. We're like, are we going to, you know, Tom was very cool. And he said, yeah, yeah um, uh come on location and I'll, I'll put you in the film. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, that, that was like the first time it was like, obviously like, what, for real? <laughs> I'm going to be on TV. You know, it's all the stuff you like think about. And, uh, but then that, it just sort of like happened in a sort of like quick sort of thing. And I'm like, you know, just, you know, in my head, you know, don't mess this up. Don't mess this up. I fortunately, you know, reacted, uh, relaxed enough, you know, where I just went, okay, what do I got to do? Just, you know, not be too uh, too animated as the old saying goes, okay, you extras, no acting, <laughs> you know, because you get people like, you know, making faces and stuff like that. And so I just tried to keep it as real as I could, and uh, I think it turned out okay. Who was in the Groundlings at the time when you joined? <sighs> uh, there were uh, Will Ferrell, people you would know, Will Ferrell, uh, lots of really super funny people that aren't necessarily big names, but, you know, it was so, it was such a fun and, and creative uh, environment to be in. Uh, like I said, Lisa Kudrow, Phil Hartman, tons of, tons of funny people. And uh, Mike Hitchcock, uh, who's gone on to be a producer of, uh, you know, an actor in, in a lot of stuff, just really, really Chris Darger, a lot of really, really funny people. Uh, and, and it was almost, more fun to be backstage sort of like riffing with these people because uh the growlings it's uh they do sketch and you know uh, monologues and a lot but um they're also known or back back at that time they're they were known uh almost predominantly for improv and so it, 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 with to do improv well you gotta you know there's oh that attracts a lot of smart very funny people who can make up stuff you know, via training, it's, it's not like uh, you're just, okay, you're in the ground, like, go on stage, it'd be funny, if we, if there's no training whatsoever for you, but no, I mean, there, that's what the school was about, the classes and what have you, but uh, just being around with such an intense, uh, funny group of people was uh, was so much fun, like I said, the backstage stuff was uh, as fun as the stuff, uh, the, the performances on stage, and and I, and I love writing the sketches and cr coming up with characters, but my favorite part about being in the Growlings was doing uh, improvisational comedy. I want to talk about some of the shows you wrote for in the 90s and early early 80s, late in 90s, early sure. 90s, late late 80s, early 90s. Thank you, Brain. Mm -hmm. Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Yes, that was an interesting show. That was another one of those sort of like. Uh, being thrown into the fire, so to speak, or the, the pot of boiling water. Um, that was my first real, one of my first real credits. Um, and uh, my my friend, uh, Troy Miller, who, he's the guy that does a lot of the comedy films before the Oscars, and he's he's a uh, you know, well-respected director and very funny also. And, uh, you know, he was working as a, I want to say, uh, like an associate producer, back in those days uh on on this show on the super mario brothers super show and then, uh, uh deke was doing uh the uh animated part uh, but they they cast captain lou albano and danny wells as uh mario and luigi to do they did the voice in the cartoons but then they wanted to do like a live action wraparounds and so they needed somebody to to run that and some writers and what have you and, and my my friend Troy said, eh, "Roger will do it." And I'm like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> so, uh, you know, I did that. It was it was challenging. Uh, some of it was not fun, but I would say most of it was fun. It was a lot of fun, and you know, Lou Albano was great, and Danny Wells. They, they both did a good job, and we had a, a lot of uh, fun guests on it, like uh, my friend um, uh, Eve Plum, who played Jan Brady. 
on the Brady Bunch. She was uh, one of the guests on it. So it was just, a, it was a lot of sort of like fun stuff, just doing really dumb, you know, gag filled, uh, you know, physical comedy and, and all that. Cause you know, Lou was, a uh, you know, out of, uh, he was out of professional wrestling. So, uh, you know, his, his, his stuff was always sort of a great sort of out of the top, uh, over the top, uh, sort of uh, performance <laughs> element to, uh, to uh, lose uh, subtle stylings, comedy stylings, but uh, I I thought he was great and uh, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. But uh, that was that was a real sort of like learning experience about how to how to run a show. I had a group of uh, writers uh, working for me, and uh, you know, with without not a lot of experience. And did you have any input from Nintendo or from Deke for that, or were you just on your own in regards to the content? None from N Nintendo. Deke would, uh, they were basically in charge of like approving the premises was their thing. And so we'd, uh, you know, have a meeting and then I'd send over a bunch of, uh, premises that I thought I, that I thought worked. And then they would, you know, pick and choose out of there and they'd send them back. And then it was all, you know, very short little segments, as you can imagine. You had the, the main cartoon, I guess, like the two 11 minute, uh, segments. And then you had, a live action intro and then like some intermediate stuff and then an end, you know, where you tied it all together. And I would say all total, uh, the part that I was responsible for or that me and my writers were responsible for was maybe five to seven minutes. I don't know. Uh, maybe less, maybe like around five minutes. And so, uh, we would write those scripts, you know, sort of broken up into their appropriate segments. And then, uh, they would also have notes on that and then, uh, stuff would, but, uh, you know, I'd be on set and between, uh, you know, the various director and me, we'd sort of like figure out what was working. And if, if a bit wasn't working, we'd, uh, huddle and uh, come up with something new that hopefully uh, worked. It was cool. What was skate TV? Skate TV was interesting. Uh, that, once again, another, uh, being tossed into the fire, but, uh, by this point, I had uh, been uh, with like with Troy, I guess, considered that I, since I had worked on a number of uh, shows with him as a writer, he he uh, assumed that I had a, a little bit better idea of how to put together a TV show, which is true to a certain extent than uh, the uh, creators of the show, uh, Stacy uh, Peralta, and I'm sorry, forgive me, I forget the other guy's name, uh, Craig something maybe, and. Uh, my job was to work with uh, Matthew Lillard, uh, Lillard, Lillard, who uh, was the voice of Scooby in the movies. I mean, not Scooby, uh, Shaggy in the movies, and also uh, I think uh, I think he did the voice on the recent Scooby Doo. Basically, it was Matthew uh, doing sort of commentary and on-camera interviews with, with the various uh, skateboarding uh, heroes of the day, you know, Tony Hawk and people like that, and. Uh, it was a really cool show that I I know nothing or I know very little about uh, skateboarding. You know, I know you know terms like vert and, and things and, uh, and a couple of the uh, skating moves. But uh, my my job there basically was to uh, once again sort of like organize segments along there. It was it was a cool gig. Uh, it wasn't the most fun gig, but uh, it was it was a cool gig being around all these people and learning you know, what I could about uh, skateboarding. Are Real Monsters that you brought up previously? Yes. Um, I was on a, I had a, a, a run of a couple, uh, Klasky Chupo, they're the ones that did Are Real Monsters. I, I did that, and uh, the other one was um, Rocket Power, which, uh, was, again, another skateboarding show, but by that time I was uh, a lot more familiar with it. Uh, yeah, I worked on that with my friend Mark Steen. He was the one that... Uh, like I said, that was my first sort of like real animation job between him and uh, another guy named Mark Palmer and another guy named Vic Wilson. There's a lot of us, uh, and there was many more people um, uh, wrote wrote the episodes on that. That was a fun show. It was a crazy show. You know, it was a great premise and uh, crazy good. I mean, yeah, that was a lot of fun. But that was my first. Uh, well, I mean, Mario Brothers was the first thing with scripts, but that was like so odd that it was sort of like strung out through. Uh, the animation, but that was my first um, real sort of like, okay, you need, you know, we're writing it. it's two 11 minute segments and uh, blah, blah, blah. But uh, 
you know, Mark, Mark Steen uh, was a story editor on that. And uh, he helped me figure out, learn how to do that. But that, that's where I really learned how to write uh, animation. And, and from there, I got better and better and better. But that was my first animation gig. And it was a cool gig. Do you remember Hysteria? I do. Yeah, that was another cool, cool job. Uh, that was, I think, to date, that's my longest running job. <laughs> I was a... Uh, full-time staff writer and uh, anybody out there that writes in animation will, will know what a, what a gift this was. I worked for two and a half years as a staff writer at Warner Brothers. Uh, uh, the offices at the time were out at, the, they may still be, I don't know, we're out at the old uh, Sherman Oaks Galleria of Valley Girl fame. Great gig. Again, lots of funny, talented people, uh, many of which were from the Groundlings. Uh, on on our show, and then also in the same building was uh, you know Animaniacs and uh, Pinky and the Brain and and all these great shows, and there was a lot of um, really talented groundling writers and producers ultimately, I suppose, working working in that building. But uh, Hysteria was fun. The the basic premise of that was um, sort of a comedic animated look at history hysteria instead of hy looking at history through the ages through the, the comedic lens of, the, of an animated uh, sort of uh, warner brothers uh, perspective and uh great gig got a lot of stuff uh in in the different shows uh can't complain fun people to work with favorite sketch uh, on hysteria yes uh i did this one episode and i wrote almost everything in the episode uh on the wild west and uh, I'm, I'm sort of a fan of the wild west you know some of my favorite movies are stagecoach unforgiven uh, um, open range i i love westerns which <laughs> i don't know how popular they are these days but uh to me i've always loved them and uh so I, that episode that i wrote had all kinds of you know parodies of uh yippee Kayo sort of uh wild west songs and, and and lots of stuff so it was cool now, did the, you have to adhere to? I've heard that you guys had to adhere to um, educational mandate by the FCC. Is that true? Yes, uh, I, 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 as I recall, that is true, and uh, you're, I think you're entirely right. Um, and I actually think that that was what helped get the uh, show sold was uh, that there was this requirement, uh, pretty heavy at the days, but I think it still exists in the day. It still exists to a certain, to a certain extent, even today, where it, I guess the network or, or whoever um, gets, uh, gets sort of like a, you know, brownie points for doing stuff that is uh, educational oriented. So yeah, I mean, and actually it was, there was a lot of fun stuff uh, that was, you know, that touched on various, you know, things of history, you know, like I, I wrote a, a political uh, uh, ad parody uh, back for the uh, election of 1803, 1803 or 1802, 1803 were, uh, is that right? Because it's every four years, I don't know, between uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, his opponent, uh, Pinkney, and uh, so it was all, uh, I put in all the sort of like the sneering tones to Thomas Jefferson. Who would vote for a guy? You know, that sort of stuff. So, uh, but it was a lot, it was a lot of fun. So, I mean, you know, there was like true historical stuff there, but uh, Tom Ruger and Mark Seidenberg and uh, the people who were in charge of uh, the, the writing and whatnot, uh, I think cut us a lot of leeway in terms of, uh, you know, what, what we could get away with in terms of just being funny. And so like, you know, subsequently I've worked on some, uh, you know, like preschool shows and they're, you know, the more involved, uh, how to put this, the more involved uh, educational consultants are, the less, the, the quicker comedy dies because uh, they're, they're uh, never, they're always afraid that it's going to, there's going to, you know, imitatable behavior. Kids are going to start running around hitting each other with hammers or something. I don't know, but uh, hysteria was a refreshing take on that. And, and and like I said, in terms of those guys, uh, kind of let us get away with being funny, but still putting in you know the good educational stuff. So uh, before we get to, I want to, oh, Angry Beavers actually. Mm, that was fun too. Uh, yeah, that was a great show. That was a nutty show. <laughs> As you can imagine, but uh, it, it was a great show. I'm trying to think uh, if I got any stories on that. Um, 
I think my friend Vic was the one that, uh, Vic Wilson was the one that uh, was in charge of that one. And uh, it, was, it was, again, just a lot of fun. The, the focus on that one, what I remember about that, it was, uh, there was no, uh, no educational component, but the focus on that one was just to be funny with these, these two insane characters, uh, Norb and Daggett, who, who were Beaver brothers, uh, who just had the most bizarre sort of, uh, uh, backwoods adventures, uh, you know, with each other, lots of various, uh, you know, insane characters. It was a lot of fun. Uh, once again, funny. Uh, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted within within reasons, you know, no naughty stuff or anything like that, but that's not my specialty anyway. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Before we talk detention, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of your acting roles some of the just brief ones. What well, uh, I have Cheers as one of your first TV as a main part. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, I started going out on auditions. I think I was in the Groundlings Sunday show then. And uh, uh, one of the great things about being in the Groundlings is that uh, casting directors would would come uh, and and watch the show, and then you know you might or might not get an invitation to come and audition for their shows and. Uh, there's a casting director named Jeff Greenberg, and he was the, the guy at um, at Cheers at the time. He came and saw the show. Then I did like a follow-up uh, sort of note, or like a cinema note with my head shot and whatnot, and he, he, he called me in. And, and, then, I, and then I auditioned for, I, I want to say like five or six times uh, before I got, you know, got anything. But I mean, the good, that sounds like, oh my God. But he, but the good thing about that is if they if they're bringing you back, they're seeing something they like, you know, because if, if you're just there and you're just horrible and you scare them or whatever, you know, they'll like quickly, oh, thanks. And uh, but uh, they kept calling me back. And then I booked one, you know, oh, happy day. I, I think probably my biggest, uh, my first big, it was a small role, but for me, my first big, big role. Um, and I went in there and I was in the scene that involved. I forget what the what the what the overall picture was, but it involved uh, bringing a uh, a porta potty down the stairs into the bar, and uh, try as they might, they just couldn't make that work, you know, logistically or whatever. So they cut the bit. I, I think I was one of the people that was in charge of helping bring it uh, bring the porta potty downstairs, and they cut this. They cut that that scene, but. They were super cool about it, and they they left me on in the cast. And so uh, to this day, I get uh, I get residuals. They're not they're not massive, but I get residuals on that episode. You know where where that bit was cut out, which is that is very cool. And then they said, well we'll we'll bring you in, we'll bring you in later. And uh, sure enough, a couple episodes later that season, uh, they brought me in. The episode's title was Sam Time Next Year. Yep. I think Sam uh, meets up, you know, once a year with uh, with this woman that he's, I guess, been having a relationship with, you know, once a year for years. My character was in a focus group that was run by Fraser of basically men who have a hard time talking with women. Lilith, Fraser's, uh, I guess, girlfriend at the time, uh, had a similar group uh, for women in a couple of scenes spread throughout. I was nervous, needless to say, because, you know, at the time, that was, that was I think, the big show uh, on the air. But I, So I was lucky enough to be in that. You know, very nervous about it, but also, uh, again, sort of like my uh, ch <laughs> my training in Assassin MD uh, came to the fore, and I was able to just sort of like, you know, sort of center and just go, just don't, you know, don't mess this up, relax try to be natural and uh it worked out so uh so much fun again really nice people fun what's it like being a commercial actor in the 90s well back then it was i, I would almost say that was a golden age of uh, commercial acting in that and we, we've been having problems uh my union uh, sag after has been you know fighting against this a lot of commercials, some I've heard estimates of 60% or higher of commercials are nowadays are shot non-union. In, in my opinion, I have to say this, but I, I believe this is true. The, the, the quality has suffered uh, because of that. But the uh, I guess the companies, uh, whatever, are, are 
trying to save a buck on, on an actor's back. I don't know. I don't know what, you know, how much they think they're saving. But anyway, back in the 90s, it was a golden age. I would have uh, sometimes, honestly, as much as five to six auditions in a day. There was one time, uh, one year when I had five commercials in play, like maybe two airing and three uh, on hold. When something's on hold, you get paid. So like the money was coming in. It was it was a it was it was a good time to be a commercial actor. And you know, again, I got all that uh, from like uh, casting directors coming to see uh, me and others in the groundlings. And so you get a call, you know, to come in and audition for some toothpaste or something like that, and uh, you do it. And so that's that's when I started. Uh, you know. Back in the growlings in the early '90s, that's when I started getting a lot, you know, started getting a lot of work. And then that that sort of like golden age, you know, lasted, I don't know, through the late '90s into the early 2000s. And then that's when uh, things started getting uh, a little more difficult to get work. Larry, one of my favorites, the Larry Sanders. We won't go through all these, but I want to go through Larry Sanders show. Yeah. I did, I did several episodes of that. That was, once again, um, my a very nice uh, woman uh, named Terry Barr worked as Gary Shanling's assistant for a while. She uh, was a, she came out of, she was the manager of the uh, Hermosa Beach Comedy and Magic Club. Very nice person, very funny, very smart. But anyway, she was working on there, and she knew I was, you know, hustling, trying to get work at any point. So uh, if there was, like, a little small role, uh, speaking mostly, but uh, always sort of like, you know, principal or co-star and above, which is significant in terms of like uh, how much money you get paid and how much exposure you get. But um, she would, it would call me in. So I did a bunch of episodes um, on the uh, It's Gary Shanlin show, uh, thanks to her. And then that led into uh, getting, uh, I think the episode on, uh, on Larry Sanders was uh, Hank's Wedding. It was, it was fun, you know. It was, it, that was a fun show to work on. I, I especially like working on uh, It's Gary Shandling show, but uh, the Larry Sanders show was a lot of fun, too. People will want to hear about it because you did it. Seinfeld. Yes, uh, that was that was a fun, that was a, a, a chaotic, intense sort of a moment. I got a call like late in the day during the week. Um, uh, and said, okay, we, we have this role. You have to come and audition now. And, uh, it's just one word. Will you do it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You have to, well, I don't know. Twist my arm. Will I do it? Yes. So I, so I, I rushed over there, there and it was a reading in the room. It was, uh, Gary Seinfeld and, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, I'm sorry. And, uh, and Larry David, you know, sitting there, you know, staring at me. And, and I knew Larry David fairly well from Fridays. I auditioned for it in the role, and the uh, one word was sorry. And uh, in it, uh, I'm, I play a customer in a bakery. Uh, Jerry and uh, Elaine and I think George are uh, in, in a bakery, and they're they're buying a, a cake or something for a dinner party that they're going to. I think that was the name of the episode, is the dinner party. I'm this sort of, <laughs> this is inexplicably jerky customer who uh, turns and I have a cane, and I plant the cane on uh, on Elaine's toe, and it breaks. I break her toe, and then I'm like, "Sorry." And uh, so, yeah, that was that was that. The big story on that one was that while I, while I was doing it, Larry David uh, came up to me repeatedly, you know, saying, "Oh, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you an asshole." Excuse me. And so I want you to say, you know, I want you to say like, this, "Sorry." And so, okay, so, I, you know, I did my best Larry David impression, but uh, apparently it was not good, good enough. So when the show aired, you will hear Larry David's voice coming out of my mouth going, sorry. So, but anyway, it was, a, you know, on balance, a very positive experience, and I was lucky to have been on the show. What was the guys? Oh, the guys was a uh, pilot presentation, and that's something where um, instead of going and shooting a pilot, since uh, everyone that was in in it was uh, Groundlings related, uh, we we basically put up the show live on stage uh, as a pilot, and then then people came, and uh, we got a nibble out of uh, National Lampoon, but uh, that, that that proved to be problematic working with them, and, and uh, then it just basically went away. 
let's go to, do you want to go to detention? I mean, you don't want to go to detention, but let's talk about the show detention. Uh, did you get hired as a writer or an actor first? I got, that's a good question. I, I, I don't remember what the order of that was. Uh, I remember, I guess it was, I guess I was going to be a writer on it. And then I also, I think I, they might have been simultaneous, which is why I'm having a hard time figuring out what came first. But then I auditioned for the role of Jim Kim on uh, on Detention, which was a, a kids WB show. It was a lot of fun. It only lasted a season, one season, unfortunately. It was a true blast to work on. And yeah, I wrote, I wrote an episode of The Man with the Golden Brain. And then I auditioned and was cast as uh, as Jim Kim. And the cool thing about that is when you're you know a series regular, you, you know, it means you have work every week, you know, or depending on what the production schedule is. And uh, so I got to come in and, and sit with uh, all these very talented people like Billy West and uh, Carlos Alas Rocky. Alas Rocky. Sorry, Carlos. I apologize. As one who whose last name is also difficult to pronounce <laughs> for me, anyway. Uh, but uh, it was just, just so much fun. Uh, those those recording sessions were a blast, and yeah, that that's the way to go. If you get, it's super super hard to get animation work as a voiceover actor because, like, I'm I'm a I would say a, a light comedic actor. I, I I do comedy and you know sort of I can do broad stuff. I can do subtle stuff, but I mean. That's sort of what I am. But the people that do the voiceover, the character voices in, in animated uh, cartoons or whatnot, are so talented. They can they can do impressions of uh, past and current celebrities. One of the persons that got me uh, into uh, into writing on Hysteria, uh, her resume is, was like I don't know, it was like four pages, a triple column. People, you know, you know, one of her uh, things was teenage boy, <laughs> and so like, so like, it's just an incredible broad range. It's a uh, Tress McNeil, total broad range of just amazing talents of, uh, you know, people that you 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 know, like Billy West, you know, it's come on, that's that's who you're competing with to get on to a show. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. I love working on that show. Can you describe Jim Kim? What's that? Can you describe the character of Jim Kim? Director of Jim Kim was a, a little Korean American kid uh, who was it was a comic book fanatic, and uh, so all of his uh, quotes were you know for truth, justice, the American way. You know uh, he just uh, he would you know constantly put in uh, you know superhero catchphrases and all of this stuff, and he would like he would have like uh, fantasy envisionments of uh, them uh, going on missions outside of the detention uh, hall, uh, whatever save who or what he, he was sort of an intense sort of nerdy little kid it was so much fun and and i was told that they liked my take on it so uh that's why i got the gig and like so i mean uh so lucky to have gotten that like i said in in the face of a very stiff competition were you ever hesitant to write for children's for quote-unquote children's shows no no, I, I I love uh, children's literature, whether it's you know picture books all the way up through uh, young adult. I read uh, young adult and middle grade children's books because uh, uh, I've read them my whole life. I love I love the uh, I love the sort of the tone and all that. So no, when when the opportunity came up, and and you know with animation, that's you know by and large. I mean, there's notable exceptions, but by and large, animate animation is is uh, aimed at kids, you know, for entertaining them. And uh, I, I've never uh, wanted to do anything else than entertain kids and, you know, make them laugh or, you know, make them think that it's a cool adventure going on or whatever. That's If, if, uh, if I write something that a kid likes, I love it. It makes me very happy. So, no, I've never been, I don't know about a calling, but it's, it's, I find it a gift that I get to write for kids. You talked a little bit about it before, but some of the the preschool animation you did, Baby Looney Tunes, Nottingham. Uh, any, any any thoughts on just writing for that that age group? Um, well, let's see. It, it can be difficult because uh, my sensibilities are from the Groundlings and uh, Warner Brothers, and so I I 
love to write stuff that's funny. So if I can if I can put like a joke in, you know, I have my own style, my own uh, point of view comedically and what have you. The problem with uh, writing for some, not all, preschool is that there's consultants and uh, sorry, consultants. There's consultants hanging on a, a preschool show like like barnacles on a ship, you know, and and their whole it's a very laudable goal, but their whole goal is to make sure that you know kids aren't harmed mentally or the, like they don't see uh, repeatable behavior that, that then they will go out and try and all that stuff I get. But what I have found to a certain extent is that, and it's not necessarily all their fault. A lot of times it's the, the producers maybe will have an idea about what they think kids will think is funny or not, or what, what is dangerous for kids. And, 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 and I know how to work with, so it's not like anything that's it's at all harmed my career, but it's it's a, unfortunately uh, if you if you put in a joke like something these days, I just gotta go. It'd really be funny if this happened. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna put that in there, and I'll put it in anyway, knowing full well that it's gonna be taken out. But I just I have to give it a try. And every once in a while, one of those sort of things gets in, you know. So you know, <laughs> oh happy day gets in, but. Uh, uh, the, the, the people in preschool, again, not everyone, and, and this is a very, very much a broad stroke, tend to not, uh, celebrate humor and comedy as much as, say, someone that, uh, working on, uh, uh shows that are, you know, targeted at preteens, say, at Nickelodeon, you know, SpongeBob, or, uh, any of that kind of stuff. That being said, I, I think probably the majority of my work these days is done in preschool and I, I like it. I'm good at it. I managed, uh, I try to get in stuff that's funny and uh, fairly successful with that, with doing that. And I like it. Yeah. One of my personal favorites jumping head when you were at Warner brothers was Scooby-Doo mystery incorporated. Ah, any, that was a great show. Any thoughts on that other than it being a great show? Uh, no, just that. No. <laughs> um, no, it was so fun to write, and uh, that was uh, that was a show that was uh, uh, I worked closely with Mitch Watson, Michael Ryan, and then two of the producers, uh, Spike Brandt and Tony Cerrone, and of course uh, the great uh, Sam Register was uh, you know in charge of everything. He was the executive. That was a great show, and, and what I loved about that show was only two seasons, but that was by design, and they had a series-wide arc over two seasons where they, they told the story. It wasn't just a, a monster of the day sort of thing, although they had that those elements in it. There was an overall uh, overarching sort of series story arc, uh, the planospheric disc and all, all this cool sort of uh, storytelling stuff that we got to do. And uh, I would say, you know, you know, Mitch, Mitch was a, just a hoot to work for. And uh, th those guys figured out everything, uh, this led to that, and, and here's it. And we uh, set set up. Uh, we we sprinkle these hints back in uh, these early episodes, and and uh, and refer to them, you know, just gently throughout. And then and then it pays off in the you know the second to last episode or whatever. Uh, so th that was that was fun. That, that was so great, and that I got to work. You know, Scooby Doo. You know, come on. And uh, I got to work on a, on, on a Scooby-Doo series, who was one of my favorite characters. And I got to write for um, for Shaggy, who you know, that's I think that's probably my favorite character in that series. But so we had to do we got to do all the fun sort of you know monster of the day you know you would have would have gotten away with it too. <laughs> had to do all that stuff, uh, all the cool fun stuff about it and. Uh, in addition to that, you know, tell a really cool, I, I think a lot, you know, a lot of the critics agreed it was, I think it's considered one of the, if not the best, uh, Scooby series. And uh, so we got, I mean, a lot of good feedback from the critics and from the fans and all that. And it was my, my only regret is that it only went for uh, two seasons because I loved writing for it. It was so fun. Uh, I have the episode list, and I want to ask you about one, which was the Humongonauts. Was that by your design or by Mitch's? Who's the big Japanese monster fan? Uh, well, I am. Uh, I'm a huge Japanese monster fan. Uh, one of my early, uh, you know, growing up experiences uh, every Saturday night, I'd 
watch the Chiller Theater, which uh, would have a Godzilla movies. I don't know how that ch- how chilling that is, but uh, it's chilling, and that they could clear the rights to it. For... <laughs> there, there you go. Yeah, and they, yeah, I guess they, they, yeah, how little they paid for it. But, uh, yeah, so it was, uh, you know, the, the whole sort of like story arc uh, all, all came from, you know, from Mitch and uh, Joe and. Uh, um, you know, uh, Spike and all that. So uh, those guys came up with a lot of that stuff and that I led with. So, you know, uh, that they would leave with, but they would, they would give me like a premise and then, uh, you know, then we'd go back and forth and, uh, you know, the premise would basically include sort of what they needed in terms of their series arc and, and uh, all that. And, uh, and I think, I think it was, I, I don't know. I'm sorry, uh, guys, if I'm getting this wrong. I, I think it was Mitch that had this idea about the Humongonauts. And uh, I think, I think he was uh, the influence on, on that, that brought, that brought those characters in. Before we do Littlest Pet Shop, I know we uh going to speed up a little bit, but 7D, any quick thoughts? Uh, fun show. Really disappointed it didn't go on longer for whatever uh, studio politics and interpersonal stuff. Uh, it just uh, it, it it didn't it didn't go past. I, I think how do you have it? Did, was it two seasons or one season? I don't know. Um, I think it was two, but let me verify. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have my I, I can't remember. I should know these things off the top of my head. Yes, why do you not have this memorized, please? You're joking, but I I, I got a lot of it in there, so. Um, I'm, I'm sure you do. Two. Dose. Two, okay. Uh, so much fun. Again, lots of creative people. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Deanna Oliver and uh, Sherry Stoner, who worked on tons of stuff at Warner Brothers, also from the Groundlings. Uh, uh, Paul Rugg, who's... Uh, a good friend of mine is just a genius writer and a voiceover performer. Lots of, uh, Tom Ruger, Tom Ruger was in that, uh, was on that also. Lots of, lots of people with a lot of talent on there. And, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it, it's the kind of thing where, you know, it was a Disney show and, uh, Disney is, and properly so, uh, very definite about the kind of stuff that they like under their brand, you know, and that's fine. But then what they ended up doing was, was hiring. And I don't know if this is, uh, this is just me. This is just me spitballing here, but I, I, they, they ended up hiring a, a tons of Warner Brothers types, uh, to work on their Disney show. And so that would be, uh, that I think had a lot of, there was some tension and conflict there with, uh, I think, what uh, the studio would approve, you know, as is their right to approve or not approve, with basically trying to ride herd on a bunch of Warner, Warner Brothers types. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I thought it was a great show. I thought it had a great premise, a lot of fun to work with those very talented people. And uh, it just it was one of those things where it just – it didn't mesh, so sadly, I wish it would have. Speaking of Warner Brothers, uh, Wabbit, the new Looney yeah, Tunes. that was fun. That was a lot of fun. That was a that was a short one, and that, that was kind of a weird one too in the way uh, structure wise, in the way that uh, like uh, Super Mario Brothers was, is that each of those is only like five minutes long, you know, uh, under five minutes long, and so. But anyway, I wrote a number of those. Uh, I think ultimately two, two or three. Uh, yeah, great show. Uh, again, it was an, I wrote uh, once for Bugs, uh, in, on Hysteria, but this one, it was, uh, actually, you know, writing for Bugs, who is, uh, you know, needless to say, animation royalty. And that, that's how I view those characters. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I get to write for Scooby Doo. I get, I get to write for Bugs Bunny. You know, uh, just, just totally amazing, um, that I had that opportunity. A lot of fun. And now we get to the one for which you were nominated, Littlest Pet Shop. What is the impetus of Littlest Pet Shop? Uh, Littlest Pet Shop, two of my favorite people in animation, uh, Tim and Julie Cahill, uh, were the uh, showrunners on that. And uh, I've I've worked with them on a number of shows over the years, Uh, you know, Baby Looney Tunes, My Gym Partner's a Monkey, and uh, they they like my writing, and I think they're awesome. They... uh, they they can they can run a good show and uh, they 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 keep uh, they keep 
keep it funny and you know they allow their writers to you know write, to do to be writers and to do their stuff and their style and they they hire people for uh you know their particular comedic point of view and whatnot and that was that was just just a a, a fun fun super fun show to work on apparently uh i, I think the uh, beginning of that was that I think Tim and Julie were invited to go in and pitch their take on doing a series at uh, uh, the Hub, it was called at the time, and then uh, became uh, Hasbro Studios, and they came in and pitched something. I remember uh, Tim saying uh, that uh, in all the, I guess, the material they were given, uh, or st- I, I don't know the ex- how the ex- how this exactly how the puzzle pieces fit here, but uh, they uh, basically didn't have anything about a pet shop in there. And he says, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know. Basically, he said, I call me crazy, but uh, if you have a show called Littlest Pet Shop, there should be a little pet shop in there. And they went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they uh, they went and pitched it, and they got it. And uh, I think, I think uh, again, uh, I think they got three seasons. Um, um, I remember three. I think it was before. three. I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I, again, it escapes me. But uh, I wrote a bunch of episodes on that and just had a lot of fun. It was so fun to write on. Again, it was uh, uh, the uh, the studio on that gave really good notes. Tim and Julie were very careful to protect uh, us writers, protect the show from bad notes. <laughs> so uh, the the bad notes that would filter down would be ones where it would like to just somebody had dug in their heels and there cannot be, you know, whatever sort of thing. And you know, the whole premise of that episode is then <laughs> flipped, you know, because of this uh, bad note. But uh, that was like so rare. And it was a, really an instance, again, of uh, just being allowing uh, writers to write in, in their particular voice and uh, and within the voice of the show, of course. Um, yeah, I love that show. That was great. And being nominated for the Emmy? Any thoughts? Oh, yeah, that was a fun thing. I got nominated for an Emmy for the uh, for uh, best song in an episode. Uh, I was uh, I wrote the lyrics, and uh, I think his name is David Ingram wrote the music. One of the uh, assistants, production assistants um, at the Hub, uh, working on the show, unbeknownst to me, nominated that episode, uh, that song, in that episode, and that was that was so much fun. It was the first uh, first and so far last, last time I've been nominated for an Emmy, but uh, that felt great. And that happened um, when I was working on uh, on uh, the Seven D, so I, I got some nice sort of props for that. So it was cool. It was an honor. What's it write like writing for Netflix? I know you can't go into too much detail about that. Well, I've worked for uh, Netflix on a couple of shows. Um, one, the, I think the first one was uh, Treehouse Detective, and then the show you're referring to right now that I can't, it hasn't been announced yet. Um, so the, they're, you know, I'm working, uh, I worked with uh, Atomic Cartoons, which is a Canadian uh, animation uh, studio. Uh, very, very funny, nice people. Um, uh, it's, I, you know, I don't know when it's coming out, but I think it has to be soon. I think it's going to be sometime this year. It's, again, uh, so far my experience has been largely positive, with Atomic 100% positive, because the show is is a funny show. Um, my friend Mark Palmer with it was is the showrunner on it, and uh, he's so much fun to work with, very funny. It hasn't been this way on all shows uh, where the showrunner, you know, cherishes the writers and uh, just wants, you know, wants them to be protected from, you know, from bullshit and all that. And in terms of uh, Netflix, uh, the the bullshit, excuse me, was minimal. You know, Mark was there protecting us. And uh, it's, I, I think, I think this show, uh, when it comes out, I think the, I think the little the little guys uh, little guys and girls are going to just just love it. Forward to it. I want to talk about the young adult fiction you write. How did you get started in that, and what's your some of the your favorite things to write for young adult fiction? Well, uh, yeah, I write exclusively uh, with the novels. I write exclusively uh, science fiction now, but before that, I wrote uh, three fantasy titles. Uh, so I love writing, you know high epic fantasy type stuff. I've, I've written uh, 
Uh, the, the, the Dragon Friend series, uh, which I'm just now finishing up the third uh, book in that series, and uh, it's all about a uh, a poor page of a of a kind knight back in the days of King Arthur, and uh, he comes up with uh, an elaborate the page does uh, comes up with an elaborate plan to get his knight a seat at the round table, and <laughs> things go horribly wrong. And uh, so, it's, and so there's a comedic elements in it, but uh, it's basically he spends the next, it'll be the next three books trying to fix what he what he set up, and, and uh, goes on adventures. Uh, you know, tries to befriend a, a horde of uh, ill-tempered dragons, goes up to the in, into the clouds up uh, the, the vine uh, to uh, rescue one of his friends from uh, you know. Uh, Giants, and, and the third one, he goes on an adventure. Uh, he goes into the Norse world and goes uh, to Svartalheim, which is uh, the realm of the dark elves, and uh, to again uh, help his grandfather who's running into trouble. So I, I, I love writing fantasy, and then just recently, um, well, about a year ago, I uh, it was a cool thing. There was a, a an Amazon uh, like a competition called the uh, Kindle Scout. And in the Kindle Scout, uh, any, anyone who was interested submitted manuscripts. And uh, what they would do, there's a, they have an imprint, which is like a, sort of almost like a little publishing arm called Kindle Press. And uh, if you were uh, one of the titles chosen, then your novel would be uh, published on Kindle Press. And uh, I've been working on this uh, science fiction novel because I love science. I love fantasy. I love science fiction. Uh, so I wrote this book. And it's called ghost star and i submitted it uh into the competition and uh, wonders of all wonders it got picked and i was you know there's one one of, again in, in terms of writing one of my uh easily um one of my career highlights so uh you know it got published it's been out for came out in january so a little over a year year and a half it's been doing well uh lots of reviews and people seem to like it it's it's just a basically it's a flat out adventure, space adventure, sort of a a space opera. Um, and that's that's a term they used to describe stuff like Star Wars, where there's sort of like a uh, I don't know uh, like a royalty sort of thing uh, um, going on, uh, but uh, also a lot of hard science fiction, with spaceships and interplanetary travel and whatnot. So uh, this this is what this book falls into that sweet spot. And, I love it, and uh, I've, I've got the uh, sequel for that all uh, outlined out. That That's sort of like, I would have to say, my dream job, if I could just spend my time writing uh, young adult and middle grade novels, I'd be, uh, I'd be happy as a clam, as the saying goes. Uh, we're going to wrap up with uh, the question that I have a list of names. <laughs> then I have a list of then I have a list of names. Just quick thoughts on them. But first, we'll start with the question we always end with, which is, um, what advice would you have for someone who wanted to be a film and television writer, or in your case, a young young adult writer? Well, uh, film and television writer. My expertise is obviously in animation, so I would just have to say you have to. Uh, but let's see, number of ways to do this. I was prepped and ready to get into uh, some form of showbiz writing by the fact that I was, I uh, in my case, started out with uh, sitcoms. I picked sitcoms that I liked or that I would like to write a, a sample episode for, and I watched them, and I studied them, and I wrote a sample ep episode, and then I wrote another sample episode for another show and another show and another show. So, uh, so I think I had maybe in total, uh, I haven't written one lately, but I would say in total, I had 10 different sample scripts uh, for different shows. Current uh, is, is always better. And then what I used that, those for was uh, to get work on shows, but also um, to get an agent. And uh, it's very, very important to get an agent, uh, unless you know somebody on the show. Like, for example, uh, when I got my uh, first animation gig on uh, uh, Our Real Monsters, I didn't have an agent, but I have a friend who's a story editor and called me in. And so uh, basically what that means is, uh, you know, they'll vouch for you. So it, it super helps to have uh, to know somebody. It's, it's one of those things that's who you know. What you have to do 
you have to make yourself ready for the opportunity when it comes along. And that means, like I said, writing, writing a sample sitcoms. Uh, I had, I have a, a sketch sample, you know, I, I don't submit to sketch shows uh, that much anymore, but I, I have my sketch sample and uh, well, actually I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just sold two sketches to a show called Studio C. So uh, that's, that's totally wrong. Okay. But anyway, you're prepared in that you've gotten your game up to the level where it's like, you know, suddenly you're presented with an opportunity where either you're going to, um, you know, you've been, uh, you've written a query letter to a, uh, a television a writing agent, which are called theatrical agents. Um, book agents are also called theatrical agents. So that's why I, sort of delineate that but uh, whatever you're invited to submit to a, a, a cartoon or to an agent or whatever uh, an animated show and you're ready so it's not like you know oh well uh yeah give me a couple weeks and you know it's like no you know you're you've, you've written a number of samples so you're like you're like okay i know what script structure is like you know because i I've, I've gotten a copy of cheers or whatever the you know the current thing is uh you know big bang theory and and i've gone through that and i I see how this is and you've gone through that exercise you know in terms of like uh making it look like it looks on their show which sounds like well that sounds really dull and uninteresting but that's sort of like the base level stuff that if if someone's reading it someone in a position to make a decision is reading that and that stuff's wrong they just kind of this this guy's amateur you know, and it's like, so you want to get that sort of like basic stuff. Does it, does the script look right? Does it match what the format is for the particular show that it's a spec, you know, uh, episode of, you know, yes. Okay. And then on top of that, they're going, okay, you know, it's like this is all subconscious. I'm thinking, you know, they'll look at that and they'll go, okay, uh, well, the, you know, all the basics, the, okay, he's got the basics and <laughs> that's kind of funny. And, you know, enough, that's kind of funny, you know, in terms of comedy, I, I, drama, I, I don't write, so I don't know. Then it just increases your chances of, uh, of getting a job. Um, anything more about that before I move on to books? Or? No, whatever you want to say. Okay. And then, uh, so moving on to books, uh, that I got into that basically because I love, Read. I'm an avid reader. I love reading science fiction. I love reading fantasy, <laughs> and almost to the exclusion of all else, which is uh, some people say well, read broadly, and you know? and that's a valid point of view. I that doesn't work for me because I don't. I'm I'm largely uninterested in books <laughs> that are not science fiction and fantasy. That's what I like to read. And, As a historian, uh, I'm offended by you, but okay. <laughs> I, I apologize, but. Uh, and I know there's a valid other opinions, but that's, if you're asking me, that's what I'm telling you. Um, that's what I like to read. And so consequently, uh, you know, after just, you know, my whole life, I think I read my first science fiction book, maybe in the fourth grade. And, you know, I was like, Ding! so I, I've been reading, that's why I've been reading, you know, all the, all the time, you know. Uh, so uh, back about, actually, when I was working on my gym partner as a monkey, there was a, there was times where there was like uh, gaps where I'd be in my little cubicle and I'd be like, you know, it, the, the idea occurred to me that I should try to write a fantasy novel. And uh, that's where the whole dragon friend thing came from. And, and I just got in. And once again, that's just one of those things where you have to just do it. Cause it's like, I, I, I hadn't written a novel at that point and did not know how to write a novel. I, I, but I'd read enough. That's an advice I give to like when I go to schools to talk about being a, a book writer, whether it's picture books or, or above. I, I tell them, read, read, read. And, you know, read, read books that you think are great, whatever your specialty is going to be, and read books that are bad. And uh, from bad books, you learn a lot as in that obviously you learn uh, what not to do. You, know, you read good books that you like, and that, that gives you, you know, tips on how to write a compelling story. And uh, so, my my advice for people that are wanting to get into novels is to read, read, read. Eventually, you'll come up. Uh, if you're thinking, you know, I I, I want to write a book, I want to write a book. You'll you'll come up. You know, you'll it'll be percolating, and some people get flashes of inspiration like a lightning bolt. For me, it's more sort of a gradual. Uh, process in that, you know, I'll decide that I want to 
I want to write something set back in the days of King King Arthur, but I don't want it to be a, the typical sort of King Arthur. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but the, uh, so I did a comedic twist on the King Arthur sort of myth, and uh, you know introduced a sort of little sub character that then goes as his adventure. And you know Arthur is in the book, but that's that's what I did, and so I came up with an idea. And then I'm a I'm an outliner. I like to outline stuff, and the, the the other version is called a pantser, P A N T S E R, and that's someone who does stuff by the, by the seat of their pants. And you know, just like oh, I'm just gonna sit down and write about a guy in a space station or whatever. And and you know what? I, I'm sure some people can get away with that, but that that to me, like I I've tried that. I early on in my career, I tried that uh, on on screenplays. I, I would get about Honestly, like two or three times, uh, I got up to about page 30, and I had no idea what I wanted to do past that point. So what I what I do is I outline everything, and the thing is, in an outline, when you get up to that point, or what do I do next, you can you can think about it, you know, in in sort of a shorthandy kind of way, and you know, even like just like a sentence or something, and then and then he 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 follows he finds the secret entrance to the cave. Oh yeah, and in the cave is you know blah blah blah. So that's how I do that. And and once I get that, it's a, at some point because a lot of people are sort of like they'll hold it back because it's it's the old thing where you know don't let the uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good. They're like you know all right, well this this has to be perfect. No no no. Uh, I my method is to just write uh, with the idea that I'm going to go back and fix it. And uh, that's that's I guess I kind of picked that up from being a professional, you know, animation and TV writer. Is that uh, you know you you just you got to write, you have to write. So uh, that's that's my advice uh, to uh, people that want to write uh, books: is uh, read a lot, read a lot in the area that you want to write in. Once you decide, just start writing, and then write till you finish the book, which. Uh, you know, apparently some people have trouble doing that. I understand that, but it's like you're going to do it. You're either going to do it or you're not. And if you're not, don't bother with it. But if you, if it's something that you want to do and it keeps there's that once again that little tickle in the back of your head going, yeah, I've, I've, I've always wanted to write a novel. That you know, it was me. It's like, and then finally, I just went, all right, I'm going to write a novel. I don't know, it can be as terrible as it can be. Whatever, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try to organize it, and then. And then I uh, I jumped into the uh, to the uh, Nano Rimo. Are you familiar with that National no, Novel Rimo? Did, are you? I'm sorry. No, sir. No. no. Not, okay. Well, every November, this is not this is another sort of good uh, kick in the pants motivator type thing that people might find useful. There's a thing that happens every November, and it's called the National Novel Writing Month. Nano Rimo. Look it up. It's it's you know. Among writers, it's well known. Basically, the the premise of of this uh, contest, it's all it's not a contest, but it it's sort of set up that way to sort of like get people going. Is that uh, within 30 days, you're going to write a novel, 50,000 words. You're going to write 50,000 words in 30 days, and uh, that's going to be the novel. And in my case, my novels tend to be around 70,000, so it was basically you know, the, uh, the start of the novel. So I signed up for that. I sort of redid the dragon friend, outlined it, you know, more thoroughly and stuff like that. And that's what I did my NaNoWriMo for. And that's, that's how I finished that, that. Actually, that's how I got started to finish my, uh, my first novel. So I, I highly recommend it if you need, cause what it, there's like an accountability factor to it. And, uh, what it does is uh, it, it, you you have to commit to writing a certain amount each day. I think it's uh, 1,650 words a day for the month of November. Some people are, are snobs about it, and they speak disparagingly of it. Uh, I'm not in that category. I think anything that gets you writing is a good thing. I, I loved it, and it, it, I got uh, I got GoStar out of it. I got um, Dragon Friend. I got Dragon Giant Killer. I got uh, four novels out of it. So, yeah. So uh, I heartily recommend Nano Rimo National Novel Writing Month, and it uh, runs all through uh, uh, November. 
I have a series of names of people you worked with or may have worked with. Uh, just any quick thoughts on them. Uh, did you ever work with Andy Hayward directly or indirectly? Yes, I met him. Uh, he was uh, the big cheese at Deke. To be honest, I did not have much contact with him, but yes, I would uh, I would run across him uh, on occasion. Did you work with Robbie London, or was he primarily animation? Also, uh, he was the guy. Uh, it's been a while, but uh, my understanding he was the uh, like the story editor for the animated parts of uh, that show. Uh, did you ever work directly or indirectly with Vin DeBona when you were on Scanned Camera or America's Funny Some Videos? Yeah, Ben had his thing going on. Uh, on America, America's Funny Some Videos, I worked on the foreign edition, so we were sort of like, you know, in our sort of back office, a little space there. But yeah, I've, I actually first met, uh, I know he wouldn't remember this, but I first met Ben back when I was a runner on Fridays, and he was the unit production manager, which is sort of a, a production-y sort of thing on, on the studio side, who was uh, worked on our show. So yeah, I've known him uh, pretty much from the beginning. Chris Darga. Yeah, I love Chris Darga. He's a, so funny, He's such a talented actor. We were in the Groundlings together, that's where I met him, and uh, have uh, have been friends ever since. Uh, he, uh, as I know, I'm sure you know, was on uh, MXC and uh, as one of the voices and uh, you know he's he's just he's he is a really good actor he's a I mean like he, you know I, like I said I sort of describe myself as a light co comic actor comedic actor he is a really he's he's got he fires on all cylinders you know drama and all that he's and he's very funny he's, he's hilarious he's a good guy good egg and uh, very 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 funny and good. I'm, I'm uh, lucky uh, to have him as a friend. Did you work with Tom Ruger? I did. Yeah. Thoughts on times, him? Uh, on, uh, starting on Hysteria and then 7D and also uh, most recently, uh, well, no, that 7D is most recently. There's one other, in, oh, Detention. So, uh, yeah, I've worked with him a number of times. The, the guy is a force of nature, a creative force of nature. Julie, K, Julie McNally Cahill. Yes. Yeah, she's a, uh, as I mentioned before, she is a wonderful and very talented writer and a showrunner along with her husband, uh, Tim Cahill. They're, they're two awesome people, some of my favorite people, period. Did you ever work with Klasky or Gabor Chupo? Uh, no. Uh, I think I like saw them walk, walking through a room when I would be over at their uh, old place on uh, Highland. Uh, which I think they still have owned one of those buildings. There's one of those buildings that still has like uh, uh, real monsters characters on it and stuff, you know, painted on the walls on the outside. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I know who they are and uh, I worked for them on a couple shows, but uh, no, I don't, uh, I, I never really met them or hung with them or anything. Uh, Mitch Watson. Yeah, he's great. He's so funny. Smart and funny and a, and a good guy. You know, I, I met him through uh, a friend of mine. You know, I was like, you know, as you do in uh, entertainment, you're always sort of like looking for your next gig. And so I sent out an a email blast, you know, hey, man, I know that. And a friend of mine, uh, Tom Shepard, who's also a very, very talented, very funny guy. Uh, he's working on... Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if it's still happening, but Robot Chicken, uh, he's, he's a good guy. And uh, anyway, he said, yeah, I, I hear they're doing a, uh, you know, they're doing a new Scooby series and uh, you should tell, you know, contact my friend Mitch uh, over there. And then uh, so I did and went and had a, a nice, uh, real nice sort of very casual uh, interview with Mitch. And uh, it was nice. He remembered me. I guess he had seen me at the Groundlings. And so he remembered me from that. And his mind, thankfully, you know, that uh, sort of gave me some street cred uh, in terms of being able to write, you know, some funny stuff. And uh, so that's that's how I got into that. He's he's so funny. He's a great guy. Did you ever work with Mitch Shower? Uh, I know the name. Um, On Angry Beavers. Angry, yes. Uh, uh, that's why I was familiar. Uh, I don't recall working directly with him. If I did, I'm sorry. Victor Wilson. 
one of my favorite people. Uh, he, he passed away a couple of years ago, and I, I think about him just about every day. Um, hilariously funny, super smart. Uh, we were in the Growlings together and uh, worked together on a number of a uh, couple cartoons and and uh, and what have you. Uh, he, yeah, I, I miss I miss Vic every day. He's so funny and a good, and a good guy. Really, really generous. Very funny man. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. MXC also, right? Yeah. That's how I got to know him. Yeah. yeah. And uh, oh, Paul Rugg. Paul Rugg, one of my favorite people. Period. He's a great guy, nice, just a good guy, and hilariously funny. Um, for your viewers, he like I mentioned him on seventies. He's one of the best writers I've. I've ever had the pleasure of reading his stuff. It's uh, how he does stuff, uh, crafting characters, a uh, story, beginning, middle, end, all that stuff. He is, uh, he has few peers. He's so funny. Um, uh, voice actor, uh, if you look him up, Paul R-U-G-G. Tons of, tons of, uh, great, uh, voice credit, voice acting credits, uh, to his credit <laughs> and uh he he's so funny and uh i i, I hope to uh work with him again um uh, at, at some point in the future because he's he's so fun to work with and also he's just like funny to be around and he's a good guy so uh, he was the one i don't know if you uh that has been a, a recent um i guess it's a meme uh did, thing did you see him the one where he uh has his little uh chihuahua lucky and uh, he's he's sitting there, so I don't know. If you want to see uh, Paul Rugg, he he had a little video of him sitting there petting his uh, Chihuahua and saying that he likes to do this uh, to relax. And and as he's doing it, it's, it's his real dog uh, who just apparently cannot stand being touched. <laughs> he was like, ah, 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 and biting his hand the whole time, and Paul was just sort of like just sort of calmly stroking him, you know, getting the heck bit out of his hand. But anyway, that went viral. Like it was last year, year before. So go look for that uh, biting chihuahua, I guess, Paul Rudd. But uh, yeah, he's he's a great guy. V very funny. Very funny. Skilled. Mad skills. Uh, and finally, uh, Roger Eschbacher. Genius! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel lucky. Uh, I've, I've had a very good career so far, and uh, I feel lucky that I've uh, a lot of the stuff that I wanted to do, like uh, be in the Groundlings and write uh, for kids, animation for kids, and write novels and uh, get published and that sort of thing. I I have been able to not everything in my life, of course. But I feel very lucky that I've been able to achieve a number of my goals that I set out to do. And, uh, you know, that's, that's about as good as it gets. Oh, and, you know, commercials and all that stuff. So I, I, I've, I'm having a blast, and I hope it goes on. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to talk to me, and thank you for making my day. You're welcome. Thank you. It was a lot of fun talking to you, Joshua. No problem.